until <clears throat> recently, the hottest topic in molecular biology was CRISPR. Uh, this technology that we're going to start to use to edit the human genome. And I said that was the hottest topic in biology until about six or seven months ago when coronavirus burst onto the scene. And since coronavirus captured everyone's attention, CRISPR has kind of faded to the background. It's still there and it's, it's still going to revolutionize biology going forward. We're going to talk largely about CRISPR, what it is, adaptive immunity system in bacteria. Uh, we can then take that enzyme, Cas9, out of the CRISPR system and use it to edit the human genome. But we can also use this CRISPR technology, slightly modified version of Cas9, to detect the presence of coronavirus. So some very clever guys have created this rapid point of care viral diagnostics test that can detect some RNA sequence in a coronavirus genome and therefore use it in this uh, very rapid, hopefully very inexpensive, widely disseminated test for coronavirus. So that's what we're going to try to do today. So the first question I think we should consider, <clears throat> talk about when you're thinking of, of teaching this topic, CRISPR, to high school students, is how do you connect this new topic with what you already teach? And there are several ways to do that, but the way that I'm going to suggest is that you compare and contrast this CRISPR-Cas9 endonuclease with this protein. This is a restriction enzyme. In particular, I think this is BAMH1. So it's just a small protein, and if you teach a biotechnology course, your students will be familiar with restriction enzymes. And even if you don't, you know, you can tell your students that we discovered these proteins, these restriction enzymes in bacteria in the early 1970s. And what we, what we realized is that these things could bind to a short stretch of DNA, a short piece of DNA. And this one is recognizing, I think, six consecutive base pairs, so a sequence of six base pairs in double-stranded DNA. And when it does that, it will cut the double-stranded DNA at that sequence. So these turned out to be extremely useful tools for molecular biologists then, who starting about the mid-1970s started using a whole bunch of these restriction enzymes. There, there are literally hundreds of different restriction enzymes with different sequence specificities. And researchers started using them to cut up viral genomes or plasmids, very small genomes of, of DNA. And they could cut them into discrete fragments. We learned how to clone those fragments. We learned how to sequence those small fragments, those short fragments. So all of this led to this era of recombinant DNA technology from about the mid-70s through, um, through the... 20th century. Uh, and, and it was great. And then, at the same time that all this cloning and recombinant DNA technology was going on, in 1986, a group of Japanese researchers who were sequencing some E. coli DNA recognized a, a pattern, an interesting sequence of nucleotides downstream from the gene that they were studying. So they reported this interesting series of clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats. That's the acronym for CRISPR, clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats. So they noticed that sequence in E. coli in 1986. And lo and behold, then, over the next 30 years or so, multiple different labs spread all around the world discovered discovered that that repeating sequence or something similar to that appeared in other bacteria. And, and eventually, they figured out how it worked and what it was. And it turned out to be the CRISPR technology, which we're going to focus on today. So both of these, how are these related? These are both endonucleases. They're enzymes. They're proteins that can recognize a specific sequence of DNA, and they can cut the DNA. 
So a molecular biologist then can use that as a very interesting tool. All right, so the CRISPR technology was in those same bacteria throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s when we were using restriction enzymes to cut up DNA. But we didn't know it was there until, well, early 2000s. We finally figured out that this was functioning as an adaptive immunity system in those bacteria. So I, I would suggest that you start by trying to connect CRISPR to, to restriction enzymes and how they're both used as tools to cut double-stranded DNA. So I have a very simple model here of double-stranded DNA. This is based on these foam nucleotides. And those of you who registered early, pre-registered for this session, <clears throat> probably received a individualized student modeling pack containing these foam nucleotides. So we're going to use these uh, real quickly uh, to talk about the next part of this. And that is, is, we know that these two enzymes are similar, but what makes this one so special? Is this just another restriction enzyme? And what I hope to convince you of, no, it's very different. And I'll give you the answer right now. The answer is this one is different in that it can recognize a statistically unique sequence in the 3.2 billion base pair human genome. Now, that's a very important statement to make. And as a teacher, one of your main goals is to get your students to understand the question <laughs> and, and then to appreciate how powerful this enzyme is because it can recognize a sequence that's absolutely unique in that very, very large human genome. And we're going to use these small nucleotides, and I'm going to suggest a way that you can use these with your students to sort of get them to appreciate how this is different than a restriction enzyme. I hope you devote a whole, whole class period, a whole hour, to having your kids just play with and think about the sequences that they can form by putting these color-coded nucleotides together into these anti-parallel double-stranded DNA sequences. All right, but, but, but let me just quickly suggest what you might do. Uh, you might take your students uh, and hopefully you'll have access to these foam nucleotides here. Uh, so you have a bunch of nucleotides here and you show them this and you say, this is a restriction site is G-A-A-T-T-C. Now, that just so happens to be an ECO-R1 restriction site. And your students won't know this, <laughs> but you should have them look at this sequence and don't give them too much information right off the bat. But it's a palindrome, and that means that the G-A-A-T-T-C on this strand in this direction, five prime to three prime, is the same on the other strand, G-A-A-T-T-C, 5 prime to 3 prime. So this is that anti-parallel double-stranded DNA. And for restriction enzymes, they not only recognize short sequences of four to six nucleotides in length, but those are palindromic sequences. So you can have a lot of fun with your kids just playing with and generating and recognizing what a palindromic restriction site is. But now let's think about Let's think about how often this particular sequence might occur in a, in a virus or in a bacterial genome. So to do that, here's, here's the exercise that I would like to suggest. You put a bunch of nucleotides out in front of the kids, and you have them simply start choosing nucleotides at random. What's the chance that I would pick a G as the first nucleotide? be a one in four chance if I just reach in here and grab a nucleotide that it would be G. And, and, and remember now what we're, what we're trying to think about is how frequently might I expect to find a GAATTC. So one in four chance, I'll start with a G, and then I'll close my eyes again and I'll grab another nucleotide and I'll make this dinucleotide sequence GA. So that matches that, what's the chance that the first two nucleotides would be GA? That would be 4 times 4, that's 16 
So one out of 16 times. So the chances that you would, you would choose a G followed by an A would be one in 16. So what's the chance then that I'll reach in here and I'll pull out another A to make GAA? So that would be four times four times four that would be 4 times 4 is 16 times 4 is 64. So if I just randomly made a 64 nucleotide long stretch of random sequence, I could statistically expect to find somewhere in those 64 nucleotides this 3 nucleotide sequence, GAA. So it takes a while for, for kids to sort of understand the logic of what you're trying to get them to think about. We want them to think about how frequently might you find a certain length of, of sequence in random DNA? So if you, in fact, put together six nucleotides, which just, you know, our, our target here is to make this GAA TTC, that would be four times four times four times four, you know, six times. And the answer to that is 4,096. So how frequently then would you expect to find an EcoR1 restriction site in, let's say, a plasma DNA? And the answer is once every 4,096 nucleotides. Um, so that means that back in the 70s, we could take these restriction enzymes that recognized either four to six base pairs sequences of DNA and we could begin cutting them once or twice in a genome to make very specific fragments. We could run those fragments, those DNA fragments on gels. We could isolate them. We could clone them. We could ultimately sequence them. Okay, but since those days when we, when we first developed all these tools in bacteria or in viruses or plasmids, since then we turned our attention to the human genome, 3.2 billion base pairs all of which has now been sequenced. But now we want to begin to edit those, those, those genes in that huge genome. So what would happen if you took this enzyme, let's pretend it's the ecor one and we digested the human genome with it? We know it's going to cut about every 4,096 base pairs. This is assuming that the human genome is just a random sequence, which, is, which it isn't. But, but we can assume that it is for this calculation. So if you take 3.2 billion and you divide that by 4,096, you're going to get about 750,000 different EcoR1 sites scattered throughout that, that 3.2 billion base pair genome. So you would essentially sort of obliterate the human genome. You would cut it up you know, into 7,500 different fragments. Each would be a different length, be a different sequence, but on average, um, they would be about 4,096 nucleotides long. And at the ends of those, you would have an ecor one restriction site that was, was cut. So completely not very useful if you want to begin editing and working with and making some very specific changes in the human genome. So that's where Cas9, CRISPR-Cas9 comes in because this endonuclease has the ability to find a statistically unique site in the human genome. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna rush on here and I hope this makes sense to you. So the question is how long of a nucleotide sequence does this Cas9 enzyme have to be able to recognize such that you would expect to find that sequence only once in the human genome? And the answer to that question, spoiler alert, I'm about to give you the answer, and I, I, I implore you not to give your students the answer to this question. Make them figure this out for themselves, because if you can get them to figure it out for themselves, they might remember it, and they might actually be more impressed at what, by what this Cas9 enzyme can do. So the answer to the question, the logic of getting the answer is, is pretty easy. You just start with any sequence, and you know that whatever sequence you're putting together here, you expect that sequence, the six nucleotides, to only occur once every 4,000 base pairs. 
So now what if we add another one? You'd have to multiply 4,000 by 4. And then you add another one. So you just keep adding nucleotide to nucleotide to nucleotide. doesn't matter what sequence is. But you multiply 4 by 4 by 4 by 4 by 4 until you get a number that is equal to or greater than 3.2 billion base pairs. And now, without before I give you the answer, I might ask you to guess. <laughs> How long do you think? Without doing a calculation, do you have any idea how long you think a statistically unique sequence in the human genome might be? So here's the answer. So turn away if you don't want to know. But uh, here's a 16 base pair double-stranded DNA fragment. And that's the answer. If you multiply 4 by 4 by 4 by 4 16 times, you'll get a number that's slightly larger than 3.2 billion. So this Cas9 endonuclease is able to recognize something that's that long. And statistically, you would expect to find this sequence only once in the human genome. So I'm surprised when I first did this calculation. I was, I was surprised that it was this short. But that's, that, that's what it is. This enzyme actually has evolved so that it can recognize about 20 nucleotides. So much longer than it needs to recognize in order to be useful as a gene editing tool for a large genome such as the human genome. All right, so those are some preliminary things I would do with students before I, I got too deep into CRISPR technology. But let's turn our attention now to, to CRISPR. And you know, when we say CRISPR, in most cases, people are talking about this guy right here, CRISPR-Cas9. This is not CRISPR. CRISPR is a system of many, many different proteins that work in bacteria as an adaptive immunity system. So one of the first things we're going to do then is to turn our attention now to how this functions, the biology of this CRISPR system in bacteria.